Hello! Welcome to Something for Kids, Storytelling for the Young and the Young at Heart. Uh, my name is Father Steve Demuth. I am Rector of Holy Trinity Church of Covina. And Temek wanted to say hello, and Emily wanted to say hello too. Yes, okay, thank you. Anything else you want to tell them? What? What do you want to tell them? That kisses are very good. Doggy kisses are very good. And Temek, anything you want to tell us? That sleeping all day long is very good too. I wish I could get some extra sleep. All right, I'm going to put you back under a warm cover. Thank you for saying hello. We are in the middle of a great adventure in the land of Narnia with High King Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy. Lucy's the youngest. And we have already read the first book in the series, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and we are three quarters of the way through uh, Prince Caspian. And we've spent a lot of time with the Pavensi children who are the um, kings and queens of Narnia that came when they blew the magic horn and it called them back into Narnia. But something is different. When they came back into Narnia, it seemed to be hundreds of years or so later. I'm not quite sure how long. And um, they came back as children, not as the older kings and queens that they were, though they quickly uh, were able to remember their skill with the bow and the arrow and the sword and everything else. And they're trying to catch up with um, Prince Caspian's army that's at the stone table or called the stone how which is a big mound that was built over a stone table with caves and um, passageways and a meeting area all now underground which was once in the open air and um, Aslan has uh, called to them but only Susan could see him and hear him Edmund um, was trying to give Lucy the benefit of doubt when she said she could see him and he said he couldn't but as he started to follow even though he couldn't see Aslan um, slowly he was able to have Aslan come into focus and as regards to uh, Lucy her faith was so big that the moment Aslan called to her she could see him. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that in a way, um, it's similar to us who don't have the benefit that the early disciples had uh, of being with Jesus person to person uh, over 2000 years ago. But now we see Jesus by faith. Um, I know that we're not supposed to take the story literally, but I think it's a good illustration that there are things we cannot see but we know is there. We know that electricity is running through the walls of this house, otherwise we wouldn't have lights on the tree and lights in the lamp and lights in the fire. Um, we know that heat, I forgot to turn the heat on this morning and it was very cold and finally we remembered to turn on the heat and though I can't see the heat, um, I can hear the heater running and I can start to feel the heat come through the vents. And although the sun is far away and sometimes out of sight and obscured by clouds, I can still see the sun. And in some way, I think that talks about our faith, that um, sometimes our faith is strong and sometimes it's not so strong. And that if we spend time with people of great faith, they help us to see. And then we have to deal with what happened to Queen Susan and King Peter. They almost refused to believe, though something inside told them that they should believe. And I don't know what that really means other than they chose against all odds 
not to follow the faith or not to believe that Aslan was there once more. Um, and I guess we all have free choice. Um, I choose to be glad that Jesus is with us. Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. He is the gift that comes at Christmas, but can come any day. All we need to do is ask, and Jesus will be here with us now. All right, so that's enough of the backstory of what happened in chapter uh, 11. And now today, we're in chapter 12, Sorcery and Sudden Vengeance. I have a feeling this story is going to take a dark turn, so hold on and let's go forward and see what happens. Meanwhile, Trumpkin and the two boys arrived at the dark little stone archway that led into the mound, and two sentinel badgers, the white patches on their cheeks were all Edmund could see of them, leaped up with bared teeth and asked them in snarling voices, Who goes there? Trumpkin, said the dwarf, bring the high king of Narnia out of the far past. The badgers nosed at the boy's hands. At last, they said, at last. Give us a light, friends, said Trumpkin. The badgers found a torch just inside the arch, and Peter lit it and handed it to Trumpkin. The DLF had better lead, he said. We don't know our way around this place. Trumpkin took the torch and went ahead into the dark tunnel. It was a cold, black, musty place with an occasional bat fluttering in the torchlight and plenty of cobwebs. The boys who had been in the open air ever since that morning at the railway station felt as if they were going into a trap or a prison. I say, Peter, whispered Edmund, Look at those carvings on the walls. Don't they look old? And yet, we're older than that. When we were last here, they hadn't been made. Yes, said Peter. That makes one think. The dwarf went on ahead and then turned to the right and then to the left, and then down some steps and then to the left again. Then at last, they saw a light ahead, light from under a door. And now for the first time, they heard voices, for they had come to the door of the central chamber. The voices inside were angry ones. Someone was talking so loudly that the approach of the boys and the dwarf had not been heard. Don't like the sound of that, whispered Trumpkin to Peter. Let's listen for a moment. All three stood perfectly still on the outside of the door. You know well enough, said a voice. That's the king, whispered Trumpkin. Why the horn was not blown at sunrise that morning. Have you forgotten that Miraz fell upon us almost before Trumpkin had gone? And we were fighting for our lives for the space of three hours and more? I blew it when first I had a breathing space. I'm not likely to forget it, came the angry voice, when my dwarfs bore the brunt of the attack and one in five of them fell. That's Nickabrick, whispered Trumpkin. For shame, dwarf, came a thick voice. Truffle hunters, said Trumpkin. We all did as much as dwarfs and none more than the king. Tell that tale your own way for all I care, answered Nickabrick. But whether it was that the horn was blown too late, or whether there was no magic in it, no help has come. You, you great clerk, you master magician, you know all. You are still asking us to hang our hopes on Aslan and King Peter and all the rest of it? I must confess, I cannot deny it, that I am deeply disappointed in the result of the operation, came the answer. That'll be Master Cornelius said Trumpkin. To speak plainly, said Nickabrick, your wallet's empty, your eggs addled, your fish uncaught, your promises broken. Stand aside and let others work. And that is why 
The help will come, said Truffle Hunter. I stand by Aslan. Have patience, like us beasts. The help will come. It may even now be at the door. Pa, said Nickabrick. You badgers would have us wait till the sky falls and we can all catch larks. I tell you, we can't wait. Food is running short. We lose more than we can afford at every encounter. Our followers are slipping away. And why? asked Truffle Hunter. I'll tell you why. Because it is noised among them that we have called on the kings of old, and the kings of old have not answered. The last words Trumpkin spoke before he went, and went most likely to his death, were, If you must blow the horn, do not let the army know why you blow it, or what you hope from it. But that same evening, everyone seemed to know. You better have shoved your gray snout in a hornet's nest, Badger, than suggest that I am the blab, said Nickabrick. Take it back, or... Oh, stop it, both of you, said King Caspian. I want to know what it is that Nickabrick keeps on hinting we should do. But before that, I want to know who those two strangers are whom he has brought into our council and who stand there with their ears open and their mouths shut. They are friends of mine, said Nickabrick. And what better right have you yourself to be here than that you are a friend of Trumpkin's and the Badger's? And what right has that old dotard in the black gown to be here except that he is a friend of yours? Why am I to be the only one who can bring in his friends? His Majesty is King, to whom you have sworn allegiance, said Triple Hunter sternly. Court manners, court manners. But in this hole, said Nickabrick, we may talk plainly. You know, and he knows, that this Telmarine boy will be king of nowhere and nobody in a week, unless we can help him out of the trap in which he sits. Perhaps, said Cornelius, your new friends would like to speak for themselves. You there, who and what are you? Worshipful Master Doctor, came a thin, whining voice. So please you, I am only a poor old woman. I am and very obliged to his worshipful dwarfship for his friendship, I'm sure. His majesty, bless his handsome face, has no need to be afraid of the old woman that's nearly doubled up with rheumatics and hasn't two sticks to put under her kettle. I have some poor little skill, not like yours, Master Doctor, of course, in small spells and cantrips that I'd be glad to use against our enemies if it was agreeable to all concerned, for I hate him. Oh, yes, no one hates better than me. That is almost interesting and uh, satisfactory, said Master Cornelius. I think I now know what you are, madam. Perhaps your other friend, Nickabrick, would give me some account of himself. A dull, great voice, in which Peter's flesh crept, replied, I am hunger. I'm thirst. Where I bite, I hold till I die. And even after death, they must cut out my mouthful from my enemy's body and bury it with me. I can fast a hundred years and not die. I can lie a hundred nights on the ice and not freeze. I can drink a river of blood and not burst. Show me your enemies. And it is in the presence of these two that you wish to disclose your plan? said Caspian. Yes, said Nickabrick, and by their help, that I mean to execute it. There was a minute or two during which Trumpkin and the boys could hear Caspian and his two friends speaking in low voices, but could not make out what they were saying. Then Caspius, 
Caspian spoke aloud. Well, Nickabrick, he said, we will hear your plan. There was a pause so long that the boys began to wonder if Nickabrick were ever going to begin. When he did, it was in a lower voice, as he himself did not much like what he was going to say. All said and done, he muttered, none of us knows the truth about the ancient days in Narnia. Trumpkin believed none of the stories. I was ready to put them to trial. We tried first the horn, and it has failed. If there was ever a high King Peter, and a Queen Susan, and a King Edmund, and a Queen Lucy, then either they have not heard us, or they cannot come, or they are our enemies. Or they are on the way, put in Truffle Hunter. You can go on saying that till old Miraz has fed us all to his dogs. As I was saying, we have tried one link in the chain of old legends, and it has done us no good. Well, but when your sword breaks, you draw your dagger. The stories tell of other powers beside the ancient kings and queens. How if we could call them up? If you mean Aslan, said Truffle Hunter, it's all one calling on him and on the kings. They were his servants, if he will not send them, but I make no doubt he will. Is he more likely to come himself? No. You are right there, said Nickabrick. Aslan and the kings go together. Either Aslan is dead, or he is not on our side. Or else something stronger than himself keeps him back. And if it did come, how do you know he'd be our friend? He was not always a good friend to dwarfs. By all that's told, not even to all beasts, ask the wolves. And anyway, he was in Narnia only once that I ever heard of, and he didn't stay long. You may drop Aslan out of the reckoning. I was thinking of someone else. There was no answer. And for a few minutes, it was so still that Edmund could hear the wheezy and snuffling breath of the badger. Whom do you mean? said Caspian at last. I mean a power so much greater than Aslan's that it will held Narnia spellbound for years and years if the stories are true. The White Witch! cried three voices all at once, and from the noise Peter guessed that three people had leaped to their feet. Yes, said Nickabrick very slowly and distinctly. I mean the witch. Sit down again. Don't all take fright at a name as if you were children. We want power, and we want a power that will be on our side. As for power, do not the enemies say that the witch defeated Aslan and bound him and killed him on that very stone which is over there, just beyond the light? But they also say that he came to life again, said the badger sharply. Yes, they say, answered Nickabrick. But you'll notice that we hear precious little about anything he did afterwards. He just fades out of the story. How do you explain that if he really came to life? Isn't it much more likely that he didn't and that the stories say nothing more about him because there was nothing more to say? He established the kings and queens, said Caspian. A king was just won a great battle can usually establish himself without the help of a performing lion, said Nickabrick. There was a fierce growl, probably from Truffle Hunter. And anyway, said Nickabrick, what came of the kings and their reign? They faded too, but it's very different with the witch. They say she ruled for a hundred years, a hundred years of winter. There's power, if you like. There's something practical. But heaven and earth, said the king, haven't we always been told that she was the worst enemy of all? Wasn't she a tyrant ten times worse than Miraz? Perhaps, said Nickabrick in a cold voice, perhaps she was for you humans, if there were any of you in these days. Perhaps she was for some of the beasts. She stamped up the beavers, I dare say. At least there are none of them in Narnia now. 
but she got on all right with us dwarfs. I'm a dwarf, and I stand by my own people. We're not afraid of the witch. But you've joined with us, said Truffle Hunter. Yes, and a lot good it has done my people so far, snapped Nickabrick. Who is sent on all the dangerous raids? The dwarfs. Who goes short when the rations fail? The dwarfs. Who lies? All lies, said the badger. And so, said Nickabrick, whose voice now rose to a scream, if you can't help my people, I'll go to someone who can. Is this open treason, dwarf? asked the king. Put that sword back in its sheath, Caspian, said Nickabrick. Murder at council, huh? Is that your game? Don't be fool enough to try it. Do you think I am afraid of you? There's three on my side and three on yours. Come on then, snarled Truffle Hunter, but he was immediately interrupted. Stop, 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 said Master Cornelius. You go on too fast. The witch is dead. All the stories agree on that. What does Nickabrick mean by calling on the witch? That gray and terrible voice, which had spoken only once before, said, Oh, is she? And then the shrill, whining voice began. Oh, bless his heart. His dear little majesty needn't mind about the white lady. That's what we call her, being dead. The worshipful master doctor is only making game of a poor old woman like me when he says that. Sweet master doctor, learned master doctor, who ever heard of a witch that really died? You can always get them back. Call her up, said the gray voice. We are all ready. Draw the circle. Prepare the blue fire. Above the steadily increasing growl of the badger and Cornelius's sharp, What? rose the voice of King Caspian like thunder. So that is your plan, Nickabrick? Black sorcery and the calling up of an accursed spirit? And I see who your companies are, a hag and a werewolf. The next minute or so was very confused. There was an animal roaring, a clash of steel. The boys and Trumpkin rushed in. Peter had a glimpse of a horrible gray, gaunt creature, half man and half wolf. In the very act of leaping upon a boy about his own age, and Edmund saw a badger and a dwarf rolling on the floor in a sort of cat fight. Trumpkin found himself face to face with the hag, her nose and chin out like a pair of nutcrackers. Her dirty gray hair was flying about her face, and she had just got Master Cornelius's throat. At one slash of Trumpkin's sword, her head rolled on the floor. Then the light was knocked over, and it was all swords, teeth, claws, fists, and boots for about sixty seconds. Then, silence. Are you all right, Ed? I, I think so, panted Edmund. I've got that brute Nickabrick, but he's still alive. Weights and water bottles, came an angry voice. It's me you're sitting on. Get off. You're like a young elephant. Sorry, DLF, said Edmund. Is that better? Ow, no, bellowed Trumpkin. You're putting your boot in my mouth. Go away. Is King Caspian anywhere? asked Peter. I'm here, said a rather faint voice. Something bit me. They all heard the noise of someone striking a match. It was Edmund. The little flame showed his face, looking pale and dirty. He blundered about for a little, found the candle. They were no longer using the lamp, for they had run out of oil, set it on the table, and lit it. When the, rose, when the flame rose clear, several people scrambled to their feet. Six faces blinked at another in the candlelight. 
We don't seem to have any enemies left, said Peter. There's the hag, dead. He turned his eyes quickly away from her. And Nick Nickabrick, dead too. And I suppose this thing is a werewolf. It's so long since I've seen one. Wolf's head and a man's body. That means he was just turning from man into wolf at the moment he was killed. And you, I suppose, are King Caspian. Yes, said the other boy, but I've no idea who you are. It's the High King, King Peter, said Trumpkin. Your Majesty is very welcome, said Caspian. And so is your Majesty, said Peter. I haven't come to take your place, you know, but to put you into it. Your Majesty, said another voice at Peter's elbow. He turned and found himself face to face with the badger. Peter leaned forward, put his arms around the beast, and kissed the furry head. It wasn't a girlish thing for him to do, because he was the High King. Best of badgers, he said. You never doubted us all through. No credit to me, your majesty, said Truffle Hunter. I'm a beast and we don't change. I'm a badger, what's more, and we hold on. I am sorry for Nickabrick, said Caspian, though he hated me from the moment he saw me. He had gone sour inside from long suffering and hating. If we had won quickly, he might have become a good dwarf in the days of peace. I don't know which of us killed him. I'm glad of that. You're bleeding, said Peter. Yes, I'm bitten, said Caspian. It was that, that wolf thing. Cleaning and bandaging the wound took a little time. And when it was done, Trumpkin said, Now, before everything else, we want some breakfast. But not here, said Peter. No, said Caspian with a shudder. We must send someone to take away the bodies. Let the vermin be flung into a pit, said Peter. But the dwarf, he will give, we will give to his people to be buried in their fashion. They breakfasted at last in another of the dark cellars of Aslan's Howl. It was not much of a breakfast as they would have chosen, for Caspian and Cornelius were thinking of venison pastries and Peter and Edmund of buttered eggs and hot coffee. But what everyone got was a little bit of cold bear meat out of the boys' pockets, a lump of hard cheese, an onion, and a mug of water. But from the way they fell to, anyone would have supposed it was delicious. And here ends the chapter, Sorcery and Sudden Vengeance. What do you think of the story tonight? It did take a dark turn, I could tell from the title, and the words followed that up. And did you think it was interesting that Nickabrick had suffered and hated so long that his soul had soured, and that if he had perhaps been in a different place under better times, maybe he wouldn't have gone bad at all? Sometimes I have empathy for people who have lived a difficult life and see the world as a dark and lonely place. It's our responsibility, I believe, to make the world as good as it can be so that people have a chance to develop into whole and strong and loving human beings. But I don't want to get too preachy. I have a sermon to write for tomorrow and I'll put all my thoughts into that. Let's sing our song tonight. I sing a song of the saints of God. I sing a song of the saints of God, patient and brave and true, who toiled and fought and lived and died for the Lord they loved and knew. And one was a doctor, and one was a queen, and one was a shepherd, his son the green. They were all of them saints of God, and I mean God helping to be one too. 
They love their Lord so dear, so dear, and God's love made them strong. They followed the right for Jesus' sake the whole of their good lives long. And one was a shoal soldier, and one was a priest, and one was slain by a fierce wild beast. And there's not any reason, no, not the least, why I shouldn't be one too. They lived not only in ages past, there are hundreds of thousands still. The world is bright with the joyous saints who love to do Jesus' will. You can meet them in school or in lanes or at sea, in church or in trains or in shops or at tea. For the saints of God are just folks like me, and I mean to be one too. Well, we are coming to the end of our time tonight, and with tonight's story, there are only three chapters left in this adventure. I hope you like it. I hope you're enjoying it. And if you get a chance, please let us know how you are enjoying uh, season two of Something for Kids, Storytelling for the Young and the Young at Heart. Please leave us a message on uh, our Facebook live stream or go to our Historic Holy Trinity Church of Covina YouTube channel and leave a comment. Be sure to subscribe and hit the announcements button so you can keep up to date with all that we're doing. So before we close tonight, mm, I let it go cold, but it's still good. Let's say a prayer together and uh, let us know if there's anyone or anything you are grateful for or that you would also like us to pray for together with you. So let's, in our prayer tonight, think of some things that we are grateful for and some things that we want to pray for other people. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, I am grateful for tea, whether it's iced or medium cold or hot. I'm grateful for a comfortable home and a warm place to lay my head. I'm grateful for Paco and our three doggies, and I'm grateful for the Holy Trinity Church family and for all of you and for this wonderful adventure we have been on for these many nights. Three more to go. I hope they don't go too quickly. I'm grateful for the wonderful virtual vacation Bible school we had this late summer, and for Miss Kathy, and for Paco, and uh, Mr. Robert, and Mr. Jesus, and Miss Ingrid, and Mr. Rick, and Mr. Leo, and uh, Miss Cynthia, and all the people that helped us put that together, Mr. Dave and um, Miss Kathy's charges. Nancy. And Miss Nancy, who helped us raise the funds to do such a beautiful job. And Miss, uh, Mrs. Kathy. Um, no, already got Mrs. Kathy. Um, Mrs. Teresa Alvarez uh, for arranging for those great t-shirts. I still have some if you need one let me know and i am grateful for all of that and more i'm grateful for this past season of christmas and now we enter the time of epiphany the manifestation or the showing of christ to the world lord we now turn to pray for those in need we pray for gloria and her daughter and all people who are suffering from the um, coronavirus from Peniche family. 
We pray for the Peniche family and uh, the recovery of those who are sick. We pray for Zoila. We pray for all those in the church and chapel uh, services. We give thanks for our editors on the videos, uh, Paco and Jesus. And we give thanks for all the people that came from August till Christmas before we had to close and go back indoors. We are thankful for the beautiful music that Vernon makes for us, also Jose Roberto. But we now ask your blessing upon those who are cold and don't have a place to lay their head tonight. We ask your blessing on those who are sick, on those who are hungry. And we thank you for our feeding ministry at Holy Trinity Church, for the food card ministry where people send in 5 to 10 to $15 food cards so that we never have to turn away someone who is hungry. And we thank you for our hot dog ministry on Wednesdays where we are able to give food to those who need a hot meal. For all the things, Father Bill and Father Jean, we're grateful for Father Bill and Father Jean, my helpers, my assistants, my associates, my colleagues, and we're grateful for our bishops, Bishop John, Bishop Diane, and Bishop Samuel, and for all people of goodwill who seek justice and to live humbly with their neighbor and to love their neighbor as themselves. Lord, that was a prayer that was jumbled and all over the place, but we lift it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us on this adventure and for the next three nights as we conclude our story of Prince Caspian. And I hope those of you who are watching may be able to join us this summer for this summer's uh, Vacation Bible School when we uh, will experience the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Book 3 in the Chronicles of Narnia series. Hello to Noah. And hello to Noah, and hello to Daniel and everyone who is watching. And if you want your names done in a shout out, just let us know and we'll shout out to you as well. Alejandro. And Alejandro and Alexis and um, Mia Sophia. and Zoe and Sophia. Sophia and all of our friends. All right, it's time to say good night and God bless.